next panel, I'd like to invite Mr. Josh Goodbody back to the stage. He'll be our moderator. And this panel is the, the Journey for Stablecoin Adoption. I'll let Josh call the rest of the panel this time. Super. Wait, Josh. Thank you. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, so today we are talking about the journey for stablecoin adoption. So I am going to invite my esteemed panelists up to the stage. Um, Alex Merkov, founder and CEO of Equilibrium, welcome. <laughs> Jocelyn Chang, the APAC lead for MakerDAO, a warm welcome please. <laughs> and of course, uh, Glenn Wu from Ledger. <laughs> welcome guys. All right, so today we're going to take a bit more of a deep dive into, into stablecoins. Um, we've got two quite well-known stablecoin uh, providers here, uh, or operators perhaps. We've got a, a very well-known leader in the uh, storage space, so I think we've got a number of the basics covered. So let's start right with the basics at this stage. So Alex, maybe you can... Give us a bit of context as to what we've seen in 2019. Why, why have we seen this proliferation of stable coins throughout this year? Um, Josh, thanks so much for your introduction. Thank you so much for having us here uh, and hosting this, pan this panel. Um, so in terms of pro proliferation of stable coins this year, um, I would say that um, stable coins are doing well they're becoming more and more popular, uh, more and more projects arriving to the markets, and we know that there are over, as I said in my presentation, over 66 projects now currently built, uh, and they're up and running out there and trading on exchanges. Uh, a lot of different models, decentralized, centralized, whatever, but I guess, um, you know, uh, it, it happens because people, uh, with crypto overall, gets more and more adoption um, more and more um, traction on even, I would not say that it's retail market, but eventually more and more players coming into this space. That's why crypto, and actually these players don't want to deal with volatility, right? They don't want to take the risk of some volatile crypto assets uh, to, you know, to hedge, uh, they, they want to hedge their risks. And that's why stable coins make sense and stable coins are, are, are getting more and more traction. Makes sense. So Jocelyn, what, what would you say the emerging use cases for stable coins are? So, um, see, I think Alex mentioned about a lot of centralized stable coins, for example, like Tether. I mean, that's the most common one uh, used in uh, cryptocurrency market. But the thing is, you know, like, um, there's also a lot of use cases, real life use cases out there today. Like, I'm just gonna quote, like, you know, Dai. So, uh, so Dai is, uh, I mean, like MakerDAO is actually the creator of Dai, the first decentralized uh, stablecoin uh, built on Ethereum blockchain protocol. So, uh, we have just surpassed like 100 million uh, Dai in total circulation just last week. So, it's actually quite a huge milestone for us. Um, so, for Dai, right? Dai is actually widely adopted in Latin America, for example, Venezuela and Argentina, where you know these two countries are suffering uh, hyperinflation. People are no longer using their bank uh, currencies. And what happened is that uh, we are working with a local partner, uh, a point of sales local partner in uh, Venezuela, basically deploying this point of sales in 700 stores in Venezuela. Uh, so basically allowing Venezuela to actually spend DAI and buy DAI uh, at uh, one of the biggest you know, uh, convenience store called uh, Chucky. So this is it, th this is something real life, right? You know, we are solving like the real issues in, 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 in the real world. And then there's also another use case where um, DAI is actually being used in disaster relief program. Um, so DAI was actually uh, used in a pilot program with Oxfam, um, UK-based NGO. So what happened is that uh, we were piloting this program in Vanuatu, where 30 Vanuatu was actually using DAI. They were receiving DAI as, uh, as, as an aid or cash, you know, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in times of like emergency. So it has been, I mean, like, you know, it was fun because, you know, it, it is built on blockchain and I mean, uh, with, and merchants don't have to go through this financial um, um, difficulties, you know, like basically um, tracking and monitoring transactions and stuff like that. So 
Um, I think this pilot is actually moving forward. So um, yeah, I mean, like this is th these are the real world use cases that I can actually share with you from my end. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I think we're, we're it's quite clear to see that this year we're moving from seeing this proliferation of stable coins to the application of those stable coins in real world use cases. So making them useful. Um, that, from what you're saying, is, is a key part of it. Because it's all great that someone creates an asset, yeah. but then what do you do with that asset? It's not just to be used by sophisticated traders to yeah. hedge their yeah. trades. Yeah. You've got to be able to use it in the real world. Yeah. Um, so that, that seems to me like one of the next stages in terms of the evolution of stable coins. Um, so Glenn, from your perspective, as, as a service provider in this space, maybe tell us a little bit about what Ledger is doing in the stablecoin space, what your views are on, on the industry? Yeah, sure. Just to, sure. Just to give you a little bit of introduction of Ledger to um, answer that question. So, we're protecting private keys for individuals and also uh, for institutions as well. So, individuals, we have a nano product where the private key could be uh, offline, and the individual can actually uh, access the uh, the blockchain um, with uh, you know with a peace of mind. For institutions as well, I mean, we have built what's called the Ledger Vault, which is um, an institutional version of, you know, you can think of it as Net Ledger Nano as well, but with added uh, security layers and also, um, you know, segregation of duty and different kind of customizable governance rules for a lot of the, uh, you know, potential custodians, exchanges, banks, uh, hedge funds, you know, central government to, you know, uh, more securely access the funds, but also to be uh, able to withdraw funds in a more like banking-like manner. So, you know, from that perspective, um, we as a security uh, enabler will basically help the ecosystem by, um, you know, giving peace of mind to institutions and uh, also individuals as well, and to provide a more seamless experience from, you know, uh, interacting between your private key, which could be kept in your Nano S, or your, your institution's private key, which could be kept in you know, our Ledger Vault solution to interact, um, you know, directly with merchants or to, you know, if it's a global trade situation, then to other, you know, banks and uh, corporates as well. So that's how we participate in this uh, stable point ecosystem. Brilliant. And I think one of the interesting topics that we're, we're seeing emerge is how people are starting to use stable coins, what the life cycle of a stable coin looks like, how they're produced and what they're then used for. So being a uh, a solution provider being a source of storage, you're part of the critical journey that users implicitly need to use when they're managing their own stablecoins. Do we see, as a group, any other areas of the stablecoin market that are perhaps emerging? For example, staking, for example, income generation, that are becoming increasingly important in the stablecoin space. Maybe, Alex, if you can talk a little bit about what you guys are doing on the, on the staking side. Um, yeah, I think that uh, overall uh, um, use cases for stable coins um, and um, they make a lot of sense and uh, the process of, you know, creation of these use cases is quite challenging, but we in Equilibrium, we're actually considering ourselves as a framework for DeFi products uh, in, in the first hands and it, actually we're considering our USDT stable coin, which is backed with dollar and backed by EU's cryptocurrency. Um, as a use case, as a proof of concept for, for, for the framework overall. And that means that, uh, that anyone from the community can take the technical infrastructure we have built uh, in order to create uh, their own products, which will utilize these um, sort of assets which we have created so far, right? So um, there might be some more retail, retail things like payment solutions, um, I don't know, so maybe peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, platforms or micro-lending, which makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, or more products for more sophisticated market participants, for traders, for more, maybe more institutional customers. Uh, that's something we, we actually can, can play around and build on, on, on the equilibrium framework as a technical uh, environment. Um, also, I think that um, um, I, I think that uh, like more and more retail retail, retail uh, use cases make a lot of sense. And Justin, what, what Justin means, uh, I mentioned we actually appreciate the work they make it out does in the markets because they're actually popularizing stable coins. They're doing uh, making them accessible as a means of payments, as uh, money on, on on you know emergent markets on. Uh, 
new economies, uh, on uh, more distant countries, I would say. Yeah, so that, that, that actually that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Ma makes sense. So Jocelyn, in, um, in one of the talks yesterday, uh, I think Sven was on stage, uh, and he waved one of his debit cards around, which I think was the Wirex the card, Wirex, yeah. right, which yeah. was die compatible. Yeah. Um, do you see that as a trend for the rest of this year and the beginning of next year? There are going to be easier ways for people to actually use their DAI? So I see it like, you know, like integrating DAI to like crypto visa cards or, you know, like MasterCard. I think so far, I mean, DAI is just not listed on Wirex. We are also a monolith based out of, I think, UK or Europe. Um, I mean, <laughs> UK and Europe. And then, the, and um, so, and crypto.com based out of Hong Kong. So I see it as a bridge for uh, non-crypto users to actually start, you know, getting their hands on uh, using cryptocurrency. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it kind of like bridge, you know, the traditional finance markets with cryptocurrency markets. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe taking a slight 180, um, I don't want to do this, but I will. Libra. What do you guys think about Libra? Is this good for the stablecoin industry as a whole, or is it a distraction? Yeah, Alex, if you start. Uh, yeah, let me step in here. So I, I think that um, if not taking into account all this centralization and decentralization uh, things, and just uh, keep in mind that Facebook has uh, enormous amount of accounts and access to a lot of people in the world, uh, as as a use case, as uh, for, from from popularization perspective, uh, uh, Libra's case makes a lot of sense, right? Because we we, we saw that uh, the interest towards blockchain uh, space uh, was increased as soon as Libra's use cases come came over into media and there were discussions and everything. Um, if to dig deeper into details, how exactly it's implemented, all these custodian things, for sure, for people who are in, into blockchain, into this industry, they understand what's what's actually underlying all this stuff. Uh, but in general, like, uh, I mean, we are very big on Telegram networking in Equilibrium, for example, because uh, we see that Telegram, uh, actually Telegram has always, oh, 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 also some big, huge infrastructure, uh, the huge access to uh, the users, huge exposure, and uh, building things on Telegram open network makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I think that building things on Telegram open network actually makes more sense than doing things like Libra because it, you can do things in a more decentralized way. Uh, but again, so any project which has access to this user base um, from marketing and from like popularization perspective, um, very important. Uh, but from a technical perspective, suddenly we have we, we, we know all the drawbacks of Libra. Gotcha. Claire, what do you think about uh, Libra? Good or bad? Um, I think from you know crypto industry perspective, it's definitely a positive. I mean, you know, if um, our <coughs> Facebook apps or you know any of the uh, Calibra uh, partic participants um, that are providing different services to our mobile or our desktop. Um, creates a Libra um, wallet and starts airdropping to everybody, even if it's a small amount, then you know, 10% plus uh, of the global population all of a sudden becomes a crypto user, which is a very exciting thing. But I think there's a huge challenge because Facebook and Calibra, they're multi-jurisdictional multi and they're battling their you know, regulatory pressure um, from the US, but what about the rest of the world as well? So. You know, as much as it's a, it's an exciting thing for everybody. Um, I don't think it's gonna be as a, a smooth ride as everyone here would anticipate. Sure, Justin, what do you think? I mean, I was speaking on a panel next to a Thai SEC guy, <laughs> and so you know, uh, it was uh, it's kind of like insider news actually. So he was telling me that the Liber team actually came, went to Thailand, and started laying out, uh, laying the foundation and groundwork already preparing for Libra to actually, you know, uh, to, to, to start in Thailand. So what he did after that was that he actually went to Thai SEC and said that, um, you know, like, I think you should start looking at building your own central bank digital currencies, you know, like, because otherwise, when Libra comes in, can you imagine, like, you know, the entire Thai nation started using, like, you know, uh, Libra? Because I think bulk of the Thai users, like any other countries, right, they're all Facebook users. 
Yeah, so, I mean, it's going to create a very, very enormous impact, actually, if it's ever launched. Yeah. Very interesting. So, maybe let's stay on the topic of interesting stablecoin models. So, we've seen over the last year an enormous amount of, of fiat back stable coins. They almost come to market at the pace of one week. Um, now, let's not necessarily talk about the merits of those now, but, but Jocelyn, from your perspective, why, why, why did Maker choose Ethereum when it was building? So, um, our founder, Rune Christensen, when he started building um, DAI, right, it was actually back in 2016, and it wasn't, you know, out of, you know, the blue, but he was actually inspired by another bit, uh, another stablecoin project called BitUSD, which is built by BitShares. So he was a very active member in the community forum. And he took that concept and then he started building like MakerDAO on Ethereum. At, of course, you know, at a point of time in 2016, there isn't any, you know, uh, blockchain protocol out there yet. And Ethereum, big, Ethereum blockchain protocol was, was being the most scalable protocol, you know, at that point of time. And therefore, I think we, yeah, he, 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 he picked like, you know, Ethereum blockchain. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, Glenn, w what's your view on, on the potential for multi-collateral stable coins? Um, inherently, they present, a, in some cases, a regulatory risk. Each asset that is the collateral type for these stable coins needs to be considered. Uh, if it's a security, then suddenly you have a quasi-security sitting within the framework. So we all know that it's a very complicated subject. What's your view on the, on the potential and the scope for this kind of model? I think it's very interesting because stablecoin itself is as stable as the collateralized assets. So if you think USD is stable, then you know you can call it stablecoin. But if you have a counterpart, you know, on the other side of the world, you know, where they would have to hedge their positions, and if there's an agreement that you know multi collateralization uh, through you know putting in different buckets of um, different types of assets from all around the world um, can come together, then there could be kind of like a happy medium for you know the, the counterparties to uh, transact in between. But I guess, you know, as you uh, rightfully mentioned, some of the challenges there, um, you know, as Ledger, uh, while well, we are um, trying to kind of help in that kind of scenario, obviously uh, we're a crypto-focused uh, company, but we have uh, partners that are, you know, custodians in the traditional space, like Nomura, we have a JV with them. So, um, you know, obviously they're leveraging Ledger's expertise on, you know, the, the securing of crypto private keys, but also they have the ability to uh, create different types of uh, trust, trust structures to put, you know, uh, traditional assets, you know, gold, um, fiat, you know, real estate, or any other type of assets into the bucket. So, you know, we kind of come into the picture there. Brilliant, okay. And, and continuing on that theme, Alex, the, the multi-collateral model, what are Equilibrium's plans for a multi-collateral build? Um, so firstly, um, I, I, let me give a little bit technical background on um, why actually uh, projects require multi-consultation. So we all know that uh, decentralized stable coins, uh, their, their um, market cap is actually uh, limited with the uh, uh, market cap of underlying collateral. And uh, more, furthermore, so uh, it's not that limitation of mark by market cap, but uh, with the floating amount of secondary market. So what it means, if uh, there's some black swan events come, uh, is coming, so you, you need to be able to liquidate all the supply of stable coins uh, in order to provide like so some sort of like safe profile to your users and uh, in, in this case uh, you actually you're relying just on floating amounts of the secondary markets of particular assets which is underlying your, your stable coin. That's why actually I, I know that you guys in MakerDAO are launching multi-collateral DAI on uh, uh, ne next, 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 next week. Uh, th this is a smart decision. Uh, I know moreover that you guys are obtaining, I guess, worker deal license in the US, right? So you, you actually will, will be going big on, on different other types of collaterals, right? And I, I also think that that makes sense. In, in equilibrium, we have a little bit different approach. Like we see that uh, we, we see like uh, more value in collaterals on different other chains, right? So rather than in uh, collaterals which are on the same chain as uh, you are operating. 
Uh, and uh, from this perspective, we actually consider ourselves as a multi-chain framework, right? So we, uh, we in further, we are uh, going for for other other uh, uh, cryptocurrency on other chains uh, as well. Brilliant. Okay. So Jocelyn, in terms of what what you guys have been doing for the multi-collateral model, recently you had a a voting mechanism that was in place to allow holders to choose which the next collateral type could be. Maybe tell us a little bit about how that went and what the thinking was. So the current system of DAI is actually backed by single collateral, which is Ethereum itself. So like what Alex rightly say, uh, you know, if there's a black swan event, you know, and the un when the underlying asset is just one single asset, it's very, very dangerous to the entire system. So in order to make whole the system, so we decided to actually build a multi-collateral DAI system, which we'll be launching on Monday. Uh, we have been calling for voting, you know, on um, additional collaterals that our users want to see in uh, the new ver newer version of Dai. And um, so, when we launch multi-collateral Dai, basic attention to token will be the first uh, collateral to be added to MCD. And uh, there, there will be a new uh, feature uh, at launch as well called Dai Savings Rate. We'll, um, there's another new smart contracts function that will be built and launched um, next Monday, where users can actually lock up Dai in the Die savings rate uh, smart contract to accrue interest. So uh, I think we will we, we are going to start with like two percent interest, which is very very competitive to um, what the interest rate uh, of the rest of the decentralized lending protocols are actually offering today. For example, Compound Finance, uh, Dharma, DYDX. Yeah. So I mean, of course, you know, like um, see the thing is. Um, opening up to tokenized real assets is going to be a, a, a whole new ball game for us because, I mean, you know, Ethereum being a crypto asset and, you know, uh, and, uh, and obviously we want to start, uh, you know, slow and um, steady uh, just by adding crypto assets to multi-collateral DAI. But eventually uh, what, what is going to happen is that tokenized real assets, for example, uh, tokenized securities, bonds, real estate, um, un, uh, unpaid invoices, and also future music royalties can be actually tokenized in LCDP, which is that uh, lending protocol, to generate loans. So what happened right now is that uh, we have been actually uh, piloting uh, pro two projects actually with uh, a company called uh, Centripede, which is based out of the UK. So what happened is that uh, they are allowing users to tokenize um, unpaid invoices and music royalties into uh, the CDP and in terms of generating loans. So what we see here is that, you know, uh, when we open up uh, MC, uh, uh, MCD collateral types um, for tokenized real assets, we're gonna see a lot more capitals being unlocked in the traditional uh, finance market. And it's huge, actually, yeah. Super, okay. Sorry, you want to add something else? Yeah, I wanted to add the words here. So um, basically, in general, uh, with regards to approach, uh, um, a multicultural approach, uh, you need to be sure that asset which you are picking for this multiculturalization uh, should be liquid, right? Otherwise, you will you will actually miss, uh, y you will lose the, the trust from the community, from, um, you know, some uh, smart people who are actually trusting your system and your culturalized stable coin. That's why you need to be very accurate and precise in terms of uh, choosing choosing the uh, types of collaterals. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, guys, so we are reaching the end of the panel. Uh, before we kick things off, we've got time probably for one, maybe one and a half questions. Does anybody have a question that they would like to bring to the panelists? Any questions? Don't be shy. Oh, we've got one over there. Yeah. Go ahead. How do you say this? This is for the whole panel, and I don't know how much you guys have been involved in um, the Macquarie, sorry, Singapore project Uber. Yep. Have you heard of Project Uber, yeah, which is to digitize and put the Singapore dollar yep. on the DLT? Yeah. What's your view of um, these central back, uh, banking back initiatives? I'm going to pick this, because I was invited by Asian Development Bank to their third finance forum. Um, um, just last week on Manila. I've been coughing a lot because I, I spoke a lot, you know, at all these different conferences. So, um, so IMF was there. So they're trying to push like synthetic CBDC, central bank digital currency, so all these different central governments right now. So synthetic CBDCs is essentially just, you know, a, pri a, a private and public partnership of, of, of creating uh, a CBDC. So, uh, 
what happened is that funds are still being custody and backed by the central government, where uh, you know they, they're still inviting the private players to come in to build that front end layer uh, that that you know on, on of applications um, at the front. So I think. What we are gonna see next year is that we'll see a lot more CBDCs actually uh, coming out from um, you know central governments, and then uh, the entire stablecoin landscape is gonna be very fragmented. We have like institutional CBDC, and then um, like gov central government CBDC, and then we have institutional stablecoins like JPM coin, and then what else like Libra, and then we have you know like private players like us. Even then, you know, we have centralized and decentralized. So um, I mean, central governments are pretty open about you know like inviting like private players in, in, into the space. But just that um, I think um, yeah. So I, I I mean like I, I see that you know there there's still a, a pretty pretty um, yeah complicated process. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me let me also add my fifty cents to him. <laughs> maybe, maybe dollars. Uh, so, <clears throat> look, I think that um, actually, like, decentralized stable coins, they're not triggering that much regulatory side of things, yeah. right? And that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So we basically can uh, launch almost any, uh, any currency-backed stable coin uh, without relying on some uh, central governmental body, yeah. right? Uh, that, that actually what, what we are uh, we're going to do on the side of equilibrium because we have some uh, you know particular arrangements in this space uh, potential partners who are interested in launching um, I would say interesting projects around this um, local currency tax stable courts uh, for sure if you have uh, if you have the uh, the support from the side of authorities uh, this actually makes things um, uh, faster and easier Right, um, but again, look. Uh, I, I think that definitely it, it, it is uh, kind of the the box of Pandora is open, and uh, you will not stop either crypto or stable coins. And uh, definitely, at some point, uh, the authorities and stable coin projects, whatever they will find their synergies. Great way to wrap up. So, um, Alex, Glenn, Jocelyn, thank you so much. A warm round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you, Josh. That was great.